Well, good afternoon. I'm Tom Malone, the Patrick J. McGovern Professor of Management here at Sloan and founding director of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. We're celebrating today the fifth anniversary of the Center for Collective Intelligence, and we're honored to have Eric Schmidt here to be the keynote, keynote speaker for our celebration. We're also happy for this speech to be part of the Dean's Innovative Leaders series, so it's my privilege now to welcome you to this combined event. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is collective intelligence in the first place? When people ask me that question, I usually say, you know, things like Google and Wikipedia. Or, in other words, we're focused on answering the question of how can people and computers be connected so that collectively they act more intelligently than any person, group, or computer has ever done before. So I think it's especially appropriate to have as our speaker today the executive chairman of what is arguably the most successful collective intelligence company in the world. Few companies have even come close to harnessing the collective intelligence of millions of people and computers at the scale and with the degree of innovation that Google has. I think it's also noteworthy that Google has pioneered some extremely innovative and very decentralized ways of organizing their own company, too. And all of this under the leadership of today's speaker. Eric Schmidt has an electrical engineering degree from Princeton and a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley. At the beginning of his career in the early 1980s, Eric worked at the famed Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park, where I actually knew him because I worked there at the same time. In the years since then, I've followed with great pleasure Eric's increasing success. First, he moved to pre-IPO Sun Microsystems in 1983, where he led the development of the Java programming methodology and eventually became chief technology officer. Then, in 1997, he left Sun to become CEO of Novell. And in 2001, Eric became CEO of Google, helping grow the company from a small Silicon Valley startup to a global leader in technology. Under his leadership, Google dramatically scaled its infrastructure and broadened its offerings while maintaining a culture of strong innovation. Then, after 10 years as CEO, Eric turned over this role to co-founder Larry Page, famously tweeting that day-to-day -day adult supervision is no longer needed. As executive chairman now, Eric is responsible for the external matters of Google, partnerships, government relations, and thought leadership, as well as advising Google senior executives on business and policy issues. Now, it's been reported that on the eve of Google's 2004 IPO, Larry, Eric, along with co-founders Larry and Sergey, made a pact to stay at Google for 20 years. So perhaps the best is yet to come. Please join me in welcoming Eric Schmidt. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to thank Tom for that introduction. Um, I've known him for t 30 years, and you look exactly the same. <laughs> uh, but you've accomplished a lot. And the center here, I think, in many ways reflects what is most current which is the sort of notion that we can make humans really better than we started off as. And I can think of no higher aspiration. So what I want to do is actually talk for a few minutes. With this kind of an audience, you guys have questions or comments or debates. I'm much more interested in your thoughts than mine. But I, I wanted to start with um, a couple of comments about sort of the way the world's or knowledge is organized, talk a little bit about how the world is working today, what will happen and a little bit about the future at Google, uh, and then take your questions. Um, what's interesting is that 
if you go back and you look at H.G. Wells, he talked about in 1937 uh, the creation of a world encyclopedia. Uh, it was going to be free, synthetic, and a permanent resource accessible and created by everyone on Earth. And, it, and he described it as a mental clearinghouse for the mind, a depot where knowledge and ideas were received, sorted, summarized, digested, clarified, and compared. Right? So people have been thinking about this for, for quite some time. You know, it's not, not like that, it's not like we're the only generation of intelligent humans that have been around. People have been wanting to be able to do this. We finally now have some technology that might actually enable us to do some of the things that people have talked, talked about in the context of science fiction. And that's why it's so exciting to do the kinds of things that everybody here is doing. Um, to me, you know, the concept of a world brain has a lot more than just knowledge. It has a notion of values. It has maybe a notion of fact, something which is sort of lost these days in an awful lot of the spheres of politics and, and human discourse. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that we can get to the point where we can know pretty much everything, at least on a factual basis. And then we can be, begin to use the most recent techniques in artificial intelligence and computer science and other parts of, of science to begin to not only understand things, but come up with non-obvious things and then eventually predict things. So, so the notion of sort of this collective intelligence and collective action that people have talked about for a year is beginning to be possible. We're beginning to see it come out in various, various ways. Now, part of this, of course, is because technology broke through, let me just call, you, call it the sort of complexity enterprise, old line thinking computer barrier, also known as me, right? That what happened was my generation of executives grew up thinking that complexity was good, that we would build these complex systems, and we would make money selling them to corporations that would then sell them to their IT departments and terrorize their employees, basically, <laughs> right? Now, most of you have not had the privilege of living through that, but you can use some products from some of our competitors to see the legacy of that, uh, <laughs> of that belief system. But, you know, and, and by the way, that model paid for my kids' education, you know, set up retirement funds and so forth, so it shouldn't, shouldn't completely uh, terrorize it. But the fact of the matter is that a set of companies in the last decade have actually broken out of the complexity as fun model to coming up with systems that are relatively easy for normal people to use. Right? And I used to think about it that, that what happened was when I was a boy, 16-year-olds would sit there and tinker with their cars. And then when I was a little older, we would tinker with our computers. And I would build my own, of course, because it was the only kind of computer you could have is one that you built today. For people like yourselves today, it makes no sense. right? These things should just work. right? And that the both the UI structures as well as the platform structures are both extensible and manageable. We broke through a complexity barrier to make them more accessible. It's worth noting that in a contextual history, because people have been working on it for years. But finally now, everybody can use a computer, also known as a phone, even if they're essentially not able to write or even read. So that's a pretty amazing accomplishment. So in terms of uh, numbers, you know, the two, 2,000 tweets per second, uh, 48 hours of YouTube video uploaded every minute, right? Um, 2.5 exabytes of new electronic data created every day. If you get a chance, go look at the exabyte naming hierarchy. It's exabytes, zettabytes, yettabytes. You know, there's a whole list. It was posited by IBM about 15 years ago in anticipation of this data explosion and selling more disk drives, no doubt. Um, and, and in terms of devices, there's on the order of six billion devices if you add uh, smartphones, computers, and so forth. Remember, there's seven billion people. It's probably the case that we won't get to the bottom billion for a long time. We can't get them food and water very well right now. So we're probably not going to get the mobile phones very quickly either, although it would be nice to do that as well. But the fact of the matter is that at least out of the seven billion, six people will pretty much know what they're doing and give them the kinds of tools that we take for granted. And I'm very proud of this, by the way. Part of the reason that this is occurring is because we're still in an industry where prices fall very dramatically. And so the best sort of, if you will, public service that you could do is be in an industry where your, your prices are falling along Moore's Law, establish a, a basic standard, and then let the price fall very dramatically. And that's indeed 
uh, what has occurred. And it's perfectly reasonable that phones that are today, you know, uh, last year's $500 phone is next year's $130 phone uh, over, two, over two years. So you get the idea. So of course, what's happening now is that, that the explosion of user-generated content now defines pretty much everything. At the CCI, there are people who are using that information, which is blissfully publicly available, to do interesting first research on things that we could never ask before. What are people doing as opposed to what they say they're doing? Always interesting. What happens when a new thing occurs? How does it change the zeitgeist, if you will? And Google is an example of this, although our information is harder to mine for all sorts of privacy and other reasons. Uh, and, and what's happening, of course, is the community is changing this, changing as well. If you look at uh, Arab Spring, uh, one of the quotes that I like uh, was that um, we, use, we use Facebook to organize the protests. We use Twitter to get people out and we use YouTube to record the results. Again, a user empowerment model for really something very basic, which has to do with democracy and a sense of injustice in their country. So what's interesting also is that we followed that as part of this global mind that I'm describing because we were so interconnected. Uh, you're never lonely. You're never bored. You can know everything. And in fact, we've gone from a small elite knowing a fair amount about a lot of things, 0.1% say of human population, in my lifetime to the vast majority of people being able to know pretty much everything about everything in at least 100 languages. And that's a remarkable accomplishment. It's probably the most, uh, the most significant accomplishment since electricity, perhaps, maybe even more important than electricity, because the knowledge of what other people do is the most essential thing about security and safety and interaction and humans and intuition and so forth. And now you really can, can know it if at least people choose to give it to you. So one of the questions to me is how are we going to take advantage of this? And there's lots of interesting examples. I was looking up one. Um, AIDS and HIV researchers made a very crucial breakthrough, we think, when they decoded the structure of the retroviral is protease enzyme. What they did is this particular protein allows HIV to develop, and they needed to do uh, uh, essentially a way of discovering the structure of the protein. They did it with an online game called Fold It. And they asked people to go and actually try it and try folding algorithms, you know, try to actually try to move it around. That's an example when you have something important that people care about, and you can get a lot of activity in parallel. Um, and you sit there and you say, well, how important is that? It's really important, right? So is that model scalable to the many other problems that we face? People have been trying in these sort of online simulation games, various collective knowledge games to do this. Can it really pu put it together? And in this particular case, the scientists were able to use the proteins that were generated by this game quickly enough to actually, to actually produce the scientific re rendering of the protein. I'm very proud of this for some reason. It seems to me that collective intelligence interpreting data sort of produces this. You know, here, here you also have the, the climate collab. Again, another example. One of the questions to me is when it's so obvious that we're busy destroying the world, why is it not obvious to everybody else? It's a, I mean, it's, I'm trying to ask a serious question. Right? You look around you. It's a, it's a beautiful, warm day here in November here in, in Boston. Um, and, and the science is clear. Right, and we are going to, what, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to sort of sit here or are we going to actually act? Uh, we're going to be judged by our children and our grandparents and, and, it, and so forth. What is it about the human condition which allows us to ignore some of the most fundamental threats to us? Why, because we don't believe in fact, we don't believe in data, because we can't discuss it, because it's too horrendous before us, we can't do it. Well, here's an example where using online tools, some notion of how we make decisions, maybe we can begin to understand. Maybe it's just money, that people can't understand things if money prevents them from understanding it. I don't know, by the way. I'm not, su I'm not trying to make a political statement here. I'm suggesting that we should find out. Right? That, that's a reasonable mission, is to try to understand why ultimately humans make these decisions that are counter 
to some of the data that's so obviously interesting. And, and also, obviously, then, more, more importantly, I suspect, produce the solutions to these problems. So to me, the fact that we can have this sort of online data and all of these users is sort of central to what we're trying to do. So, so and, and it also, I think, informs our ultimate intu intuitions. I was in Asia talking to the, to the various uh, prime ministers as part of the APEC, because I was one of the delegates. And I was struck by how much knowledge they actually have now of what's going on in the world. Most of the world leaders that I've dealt with over my career have been pretty much, um, they've been driven by some ideology. But this sort of global crisis that we're in is so hard, and, and this is a global, global crisis of growth that we're talking about, that each of them has a reasonably thoughtful explanation for the economics and the things that they need to do. Right? So that's an example of this. And I thought to myself after the various meetings, I had dinner with uh, Medvedev, who I actually like. Uh, it's sort of bizarre to actually like the, the prime minister of Russia. Uh, and I know President Obama very well, and I know a whole bunch of the Asian leaders very well. In talking to them, I was really struck by the humility of them not actually knowing the answer to the question, at least in private. They might not admit it publicly. How do I achieve in globalization growth, jobs, success for my people, and for most of them, except for the autocrats, successful re-election, which is what they really care about. Uh, so again, maybe that's a question that your team and the people here in the room can begin to think about. Because ultimately, that will drive an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of things that we care a lot about. So how do we, how do we, um, how do we deal with this right now? And sort of as a general comment, I think we should start by demanding the people that make these decisions use data to make the decision. OK? You said, there you go. Well, this is MIT. This is obvious. OK, you're a subset, guys. OK, you're not normal. OK, there's a reason why you're here. OK. Now, so here's my saying, and I want you all to repeat with me. In God we trust, but all others bring data. OK? Come on. All others bring data. OK? Are we in agreement? OK. This is not that hard. I'm sure there's some Latin translation of what I just said that we can use as our motto. Um, so, so in this model, this doesn't mean that they still can't prevaricate and have fun and get their pictures taken and so forth. But let's start with fact-based discussions to inform the decision making. And we can do that now to a remarkably powerful extent. And, and I would argue that in computer science, one of the biggest trends is big data. I think the computer scientists in the room know this, um, that this explosion of data is leading to new algorithms for storage, for analysis, for modeling, for predictive behavior, and so forth. Probably one of the richest new veins, if you will, of research in CS. Uh, and that, I think, bodes well for this, for this problem. Now, in Google's case, we, we like to do that, and we also like to do things that are sort of wacky or counterintuitive. My favorites, self-driving cars. Now, let's think about it. There are 32,000 people terribly killed in car driving in the, United, in the United States. The current cars have not killed anyone yet, OK? And you're probably safer having the car drive you rather than you drive the car at this point. And that's a humbling statement, because we all love to drive our cars, right? Imagine having this conversation with the Germans, right? But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the car is going to drive itself better in our lifetimes than we will, especially if you're drunk. But even if you're not, people get distracted. Plus, you're not supposed to be you know, tweeting, but you are while you're driving, and you know, all that kind of stuff. It makes, in fact, it's, it's shocking if you think about it that the government allows you to drive this car. And it's only an accident of invention that the car was invented before the self-driving part. Because if, it, if the self-driving part had been invented before the car, you wouldn't have been allowed to buy, drive the car at all. It would just drive you, right? Logically, because of consumer safety and so forth. So again, if you frame it differently, right, you get the idea. Another one, we're funding the Lunar X Prize. Uh, I agreed to do this with the 
precise stipulation that I thought it was impossible to do and we wouldn't have to actually pay out the, pri the X prize, there's some danger that I will lose and we'll actually have to pay out this X prize. It involves basically um, commercial landing on, on the, the moon for, and doing some things when you're on the moon with your device. Renewable energy is another one. Uh, if you're going to take a stand, try to do something new and interesting. In our case, what we've tried to do is use data to try to make, make energy more efficient. It turns out that a simple statistic is that if you give people these sort of uh, monitors about in, in energy, on average, they reduce their energy uses by, usage by 10% simply because they're monitoring it. Hey, I'll take it. It's the cheapest 10% you'll ever get. Just give them the monitor. I mean, literally, literally, it's that inexpensive. So from my perspective, the, the process here goes something like this. You know, you start with, uh, in 2005, a driverless car named Stanley, which is the DARPA Ch Ch uh, Challenge Award. And I think uh, MIT was one of the participants in this. This particular car, um, as I recall, was a Stanford car. And it managed to drive a seven-mile test course in other seven hours, sort of slow. Um, Last year, we demonstrated the same sort of the, the logical extension of that seven years later, 100,000 miles in ordinary traffic without an accident of any kind. Now, what's interesting is that Stanley used traditional artificial intelligence algorithms and techniques. In our case, we used a learning algorithm, and we used the fact that we had all of these maps that were already in place. So we were able to take their invention, which is really brilliant, and use the data that had been accumulated and the knowledge algorithms and the training algorithms over the subsequent years and get this huge explosion in capability. That's the pattern that's possible for all of these big data experiments. We can understand the car one because it's all for us to relate, but the same is true in many, many other fields, I suspect many of which you all will do your research in. I, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about what happens when all, when, when all of this comes together, I've now become convinced, and this is a leap, I think, but I'm becoming convinced anyway, that we're going to see a virtual world and a physical world. And the physical world, which we're all familiar with, of governments and laws and so forth and so on, will have as its parallel this virtual world of interconnected people. And the two systems will coexist, and they will have interesting effects on each other. So let's think about the, the physical world. Think about an evil person in the physical world. What does the virtual world do? It serves as a check and balance, because you all, one of you sees this person, takes their picture, and exposes them and shames them, and says, this behavior is not acceptable. It didn't occur before because you're empowered to watch what they do. So the fact that the virtual world can record what the physical world is doing, it's a pretty big deal, serves as a check and balance. Well, by the way, in the, in the virtual world, there are some bad actors too. We all know who they are. Well, that's why the physical world has some laws, has some police and so forth, and keeps some of those people in check too. So in this, in this model of these two worlds colliding, a lot of interesting things happen. Now, this wouldn't have been possible 50 years ago. We worked at Xerox, Tom and I. And the Xerox machine was invented in the 60s, and the Soviet Union actually passed a law and enforced it that they would lock the photocopiers at night because they didn't want documents being copied. You all are too young to remember this, but it's true. Um, information was very powerful. And it, imagine trying to enforce a law like that today. Everyone has their phones. Just take a picture of the document. It's crazy, right? Or recognize it or, or photo ID it or so forth and so on. So, so in a situation where, an example, 600 million people in Africa have mobile phones that have at least some level of smartphone capability, it's a pretty big deal. It shows their impact on their ability to provide safety, banking, and so forth and so on. Um, you know, Vint, Vint Cerf, who works at Google, and basically my hero and the inventor of the internet, calls the, the, the internet a platform for freedom. And I think you're seeing these two worlds colliding in many, many ways. So this, this physical system is defined by, influenced, but dominated by states. 
and the virtual system is dominated by citizens and influenced by states. See the, see the duality. And these two systems will have to coexist where neither has complete control, which is what drives everybody crazy and generates a lot of lawsuits, a lot of newspaper stories, and so forth and so on. And the physical system cannot completely suppress the virtual one. During the various revolutions, the last gasp of an autocrat is they turn off the internet. Because they figure out in their little evil minds that the, that the internet is the source of their problem. Now, first place, if you don't like what you see in the mirror, don't break the mirror. Simple rule, easy to remember. You deal with your own problem. Um, but in fact, in every case, they've been forced to turn it back on. Because the internet is now so pervasive in money and commerce and food and transportation that even if these pesky little demonstrators that you're busy shooting with your police state, you can control them with the internet, but you can't selectively get them out of it. That's a tremendous accomplishment, in my view, for all of us and the people who, who helped build this. Um, but in, from my perspective, this balance will cause more democratic societies to emerge because of the checks and balances that it provides. And you know, the exposure of bad behavior by, by extremists, uh, it's just so much easier to find it. It's so much easier to call it, the various evil things that have occurred. Because of the internet, whistleblowing has is, is never been so easy. And courage has, has now much more plentiful as a result. People are willing to act, and they can actually get an audience. And you see this over and over again. So one of the questions here is what happens uh, you know, as the policymakers argue about this. They're going to ar have arguments over internet content forever. A whole bunch of these countries are now trying to balkanize the internet. They want their internet within their own country on their terms. There are now 40 countries that actually censor the internet in ways that we would define, we as Americans would define as significant censorship. Uh, it's up from four over the last decade. What do we need to do, in my view, to sort of keep this? Well, one argument we've made, and I've made very strongly with these people, is if you don't like the behavior of people, don't block the content, just regulate their behavior with the police and normal procedures and so forth. You have courts and judges and so forth and so on. Um, and, and in fact, the internet ha is, a, is a significant benefit to the police in the sense that the internet can be audited and monitoring you know, bad behavior and so forth in a, in a legitimate system. So to me, what you want to do is you want to figure out a way to let this thing play out between the virtual world in the physical world and have that fight and have it produce a really positive outcome. Have the extremists, have the evildoers and so forth be helped in media or mediated or controlled, if you will, by the rest of us, a form of collective intelligence, in, if, if you will, around common morals. We all agree that the, the following human rights are to be respected and so forth and so on. And ultimately, I think society will get there. It'll be messy, but we'll get there. And I think it's very, very positive. So when I think about the next challenge, we've got a whole bunch. We're all online. Everything we're doing is being tracked in one way or the other. Many people don't know that their phones, by virtue of the E911 law, report their location. Now, and you can't turn it off, by the way. Right. And we accept that because there's a clear benefit in, in an emergency to being able to say, here I am, and here's this thing going on. But that's an example of a, of a trade-off between two important things, which is the role of the state and the role of the individual and their privacy. So to me, the questions that we face are, how do we make the world more open while respecting privacy? How do we empower people without provoking anarchy? How do we ensure that technology enriches rather than devalues human relationships and culture? To me, these are the questions that we're going to face over and over and over again by people well beyond MIT, well beyond Google, well beyond America, because these are our shared value questions. We, everyone wants the world to be a better place. But from my perspective, we have to have a proper debate on it. We need to ensure that technological disruption is never sensationalized. The fact that we can do these things, right, 
means that we should think about whether we want to do them, and we should do them in this sort of collective notion of making the world a better place that I, that I talk about. The technology at some level is our servant and not our, ma our, our master. And if, if somehow people lose confidence in this sort of global mind that we're trying to build all of us, then that would be a disaster because they would eventually pass laws that would make the kind of fun that we're having now much harder. So we, we have a responsibility as scientists, as researchers, as business people um, to go and do it the right way and to understand the consequences of the things that we do. So to me, when I think about it, what's a principle here? No, put your user first. Think in terms of the individual. In every one of the examples that I, that I used, we've tried to give the user a choice. Uh, in our case, we, uh, we do lots of innovation. We run, I got the numbers, 20,000 experiments on search every year with 500 improvements on our algorithms. Uh, we never sell placement on search results. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're doing a whole Google-wide virtual visual refresh. And so, you know, yesterday, by the way, for the first time, um, Google has actually published a list of algorithmic improvements that we've made. We've historically been fairly sensitive about that information. Um, so over a week ago, we made a significant improvement of how we rank fresh content, uh, affecting about a third of our, so or of our searches. We've improved our cross-language information retrieval using some new techniques people invented, refined official or page detection, and made improvements to date-restricted queries. Um, and we're publishing those sort of things to, so people can understand what we're doing. So we're, even we, who have historically been very careful about this information for competitive reasons, are trying to get that information out within the limits that we can. So to me, if I look forward, the good news is it's an information in, in, in rich environment. We have many, many new technical challenges. An interesting statistic is that 16% of the searches on Google are entirely new every day. So you can imagine we're always dealing with some new phenomena. And I can assure you that if Moore's Law doubles every two years or so, the complexity of our queries and the kinds of information problems we grapple with will, will be improving at exactly the same rate if not faster, because of the rate at which networks and disks are getting faster. So in the past, you know, technology was sort of always sort of cold and impersonal. I started by talking about sort of the, sort of the dominion of, of my generation of people making systems very complex and hard to use. But I think that, that this new generation of leaders, yourselves, if you will, um, understand the power of users, the power of making these things simple, and the awesome responsibility that you all have now to take advantage of this information in this context of building this knowledge web, building this sort of global brain, and using it for good. When I think about this time, um, it's, a time it's a moment of challenge, and it's a moment of opportunity created by technological change right in front of us. Right? It's literally going to happen in the next five years or in the next 10 years. And you know, technology is not really about hardware and software anymore. It's really about the mining and use of this enormous data, enormous opportunity before us about what people are doing, how they're thinking, how we improve information, and how we make the world a better place from it. So thank you very much. We want. Uh, I hope I hope people have comments or, or questions on this or anybody else or, or anything else. Yes, sir, go ahead. In the holistic view that you uh, laid out, do you see that the, the current discussions around DRM and copyright to be a storm in a teacup or a major issue that we should be worried about? Well, um, I have spoken out and been heavily criticized by the copyright industry for my opposition to the Protect IP Act in the Senate. And there's an even worse uh, proposal in the House. Uh, so, so let's start with the other side. They have a legitimate problem. They have business models that are threatened by illegal theft. And we don't endorse it. Please don't do it. If you're doing it, stop. I hope that's very clear. Um, the solutions are draconian. And in particular, there's a, a bill that would require ISPs to 
remove URLs from the web, which is also known as censorship, last time I checked. Um, you could call it something else if you like, that's what they do, um, under the pain of criminal activity. And this is not, it's not a good precedent to set. So we need to find other ways. Our argument, by the way, for this solution is that the majority of the copyright issues are in fact people who are making money from illegal copyrights, follow the money. One of the benefits of, these, of this ecosystem that we're building is we know where the money goes, just follow it. It's electronic. And you can find who's profiting from illegal copyright information and you know, put them to the, to the task with the police or fines or whatever, whatever is the right mechanism. Um, the people, so I, th that's a, I hope a very clear answer. There are some issues with the libertarian view of this. Um, there's, an, there's a subgroup of, of all of us who think that absolute encryption, HTTPS, so forth and so on, is the solution to this. The problem is that there is some content that you probably don't want being broadly circulated. Child pornography is illegal, right? Uh, libel is a crime. You know, so there are, some, there are some lines that we don't want to cross, but I think that the, uh, the general copyright thing is um, if it, it, think of it as a dial, and if it's pushed too tight, it really could enable an awful lot of people who see, uh, who want to shut down the web. And we don't want to do that. That's my concern. Yes, sir. Uh, you referenced uh, renewable energy. Yes. I'm looking forward to Florida weather here in Boston. I will miss Florida as it, you know, we lose the lower part, but I don't go to Miami that much anyway. So that was a joke. But I think Logan Airport, <laughs> Logan Airport might be, but it's always crowded anywhere there. You might need to move the airport, things like that. So what, um, what uh, if anything, Google is doing within renewable energy context, the next generation of technologies and what role one can play um, in, that, in that whole arena? Um, a, a couple of things. Um, we see ourselves as purveyors of information. So for us, we're not an energy company, although we use a lot of energy. So we have funded a large number of renewable energy sources to offset our data center, uh, if you will, consumption of energy. Our data centers are roughly twice as efficient as other data centers because of techniques that we have developed and popularized, which I think other people should try to, to use as best they can. Um, I think ultimately our contribution will be minor compared to what some of the other major players will be able to do just because we're on the information side. Um, t since you've given me the entree, let me suggest that we've got a problem. Because the accumulation of information about climate change and what needs to be done has never been better, right? There's, there's agreement on the order, the precision, what to do. You know, you start with insulating buildings, you know, lead standard buildings uh, and past. You can even get to, to net positive energy buildings, especially if you have computers inside of them, uh, which most buildings do. So there's, there's lots and lots of really amazing information and there's no action anywhere. There's no action in the US because the climate bills all got caught up in the politics. Europe is going to not have a lot of money for a little while as they deal with their restructuring issues. Um, China will do only as necessary to avoid a lot of deaths in pollution, having just been in Beijing. You know, it's pretty bad. Um, there's something wrong here. And I, let's call it, there's something wrong. We're, we're not doing the right thing. And, and we do, we face it as a society. And I think everybody here has an interest in this outcome. Uh, in, in the way back, yes, sir, we'll, go ahead. Okay. So one of the problems I think is you have lots of data, data out there, but there's a lot of ways to interpret data. So you could be two different people, two different ends of the spectrum, say two different completely final results. How do you balance that? I mean, say global warming, for example, one side of the aisle thinks, all knows a hoax. Maybe there's some outlier data Well, here. they're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't have to be global warming. It's based on no, 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 but, but, but before we do anything else, can we agree that there are some things for which there is, in fact, only one correct answer? <laughs> well, I mean, 
Uh, if you disagree, then say so. But okay, so like the the number system starts at zero, one, two, you know, things like that. But my point is that in in the media is a, is significantly at, at, at guilty here, because in the pursuit for bias, they forgot that the jo that the job of a journalist is to ferret out the truth, whatever the truth might be, even if it's uncomfortable. All right, so anyway, please continue with your point. <laughs> well, the question is, I mean, sometimes you look at data, you don't know how to predict it, right? You don't know what the true, what's the true fundamentals behind it are. So how do you balance that with two politicians, let's say, running on something completely different? Which one do you choose? And well, this is the gap. In the first place, the politicians are doing what their consultants told them will get them votes. So I never rely on, on politicians for scientific data. I, I found that's a good rule. <laughs> Um, with respect to data and estimation, I think there's a lot of questions about future estimates of anything. Um, and I think there, there are many, many reasons to think that any future estimate is sort of suspect because change rates change and, and things compound, they accelerate and they decelerate. So classic example with climate change is will the melting of the permafrost in Siberia Will it accelerate? Will it cause a trigger which will cause things to occur faster or not? Right. That's not a question that's knowable. What we can do is we can talk factually about what has happened. Right. So that's a classic. So I would start with, let's start with data of things that, we're, that is knowable, which I think is my, my pledge I asked you all for. And then I think we can debate what the future path looks like. To me, that's, that's how you have to base this, and you have to insist on that. Uh, and then estimation, then, well, that's the job of, of scientists and ultimately pundits, and then judgment from our political leaders. There's a question behind him. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for coming to speak to us. Sure. Uh, my question is around a few years ago, some of the technology leaders at the time met to talk about the dangers of making machines really intelligent. And today, where you know, machines are exponentially more intelligent than they were then. It'd be great to get your thoughts on So, what would be the dangers of making machines more intelligent? <laughs> well, the Terminator, did, he, the Terminator was governor of California, and he was unable to fix our political system. I want you to know that one of the reasons why you might not want to drive our car is we program it to drive the speed limit, <laughs> right? So that's, a, that's sort of a judgment call. Now, I'm not sure that we would want the liability of programming our cars to drive 10 miles over the speed limit, and then you, you'd send the ticket to Google you know, <laughs> rather than to your, you know, your house ultimately responsible. So I think these are very good questions. Uh, my personal opinion is that the world will organize into things which humans are good at and computers are good at. Now, what are humans good at? Intuition, getting ourselves in trouble, right? Falling in love, all those sorts of things. What are computers very good at? Infinite memory, very good needle in the ha haystack problems, and an awful lot of data analysis. That's ultimately how it will sort itself out. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the separation. The one area where I think you might be r right on the too intelligent uh, has to do with robotics and war. You know, that you could imagine accelerants there that could become really quite, quite dangerous. But that's a, obviously a small and specialized area. But I think the general experience that we will have in our lifetimes will be these are, think of them as aids. They're our, our best help. They're our best friend. They know us. They know where we've been. And they make suggestions for where we go. There's a question right behind you. And then we'll come back to Aaron. Yes, yes sir. There's a, there's a lot of scrutiny right now around how companies Do you see a lot of government regulation forthcoming? And would that be a hindrance to the collective intellig yeah. uh, intelligence thing that we're talking about today? Um, th there is quite a bit of concern over this. The Europeans have the most, ex uh, the most uh, progressive or extreme, depending on your point of view, uh, privacy rules. We generally support these rules. 
uh, because usually they're written with a consumer in, in mind. And as long as they involve consumer opt-in and opt-out, I think that they're generally okay. Um, I suspect that there will be more regulation. The industry, including Google, um, is pushing very much for voluntary regulation because it's very hard for the government to write the rules and get them right and not, you know, sort of squelch some new startup or some new approach. So it's, in my view, it's better to let the industry, at least for a while, uh, uh, let me say it differently, don't do premature regulation, right? Let the industry try to sort this out because um, yeah, we, we're heavily criticized if we make a mistake independent of the government by our consumers. And there's a lot of pressure on us to do the right thing. Let's see. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll do a couple real quick. Hi. Yes. Um, you talked about how growing up in your early career you tinkered on cars and you built your computer and did things that were a lot more physical. So as we become more users and our computers just work, how d could you comment on how we can maintain the kind of physical intuition? Uh, get a trainer. <laughs> I think trainers are in all of our future. Somebody who makes you go through all the steps. Um, there are probably just as many ways in which computers will help you be a better, better person in terms of you know, keeping count of your calories and your exercise programs and sort of you know, all of the other things, all the intuition that you have. Uh, there's such an explosion of the use of computers in everything that I don't worry that because I, didn't, I don't build computers anymore that, that that skill is going to degrade. Now I build networks of computers. And I think it, it probably trans go, translates from one to the other. Let's see, there, this lady had one more question. Let's have her have the last question. So I'm very curious about your, uh, your idea of the check and balance between the real world and the virtual world that will come about. And I'm also interested in the idea of how might you think about using data to motivate behavior and, and what Google is pursuing in that area, if anything, at this time. Um, it's a very good question. I don't know. Uh, a research project for you all is when you put real accurate data in front of people, why don't they act on it? Right. And yet we can see with things like Zynga that we can motivate, they yeah. can, you can tap into social behaviors so, and motivate so, so, them aggressively. So there, there must be some ways, right? So if my friends are all acting on this good data, then I am likely to. So there are all sorts of ways, but I think all that, all that people in my position can do, we can get the information there, but we're not going to pass judgment on what humans do with our information. That's not our job. Right? I think it's up to the rest of us to figure out how to make it. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.